You're listening to Qalam Institute's podcast. Visit us on the web at qalaminstitute.org and join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash qalaminstitute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So continuing on with our series on the seerah, a seerah to Nabawiya, the prophetic biography, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last time um, we met and we discussed and we had our session on the seerah, we talked about the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa participating in a very noble act, um, maybe one of the most noble things um, that were done during that pre-Islamic, the jahili, the era of ignorance, which was hilful fudul, the very virtuous and noble pact. And the Prophet ﷺ's role in that pact and how that pact was something that was continued to be honored long um, after divine revelation came and Islam was established. And even beyond that, we also talked about an incident in a story that much after the time of the Prophet ﷺ, after the time of the Khulafa al Rashidun, when the Sahaba were still al- around and alive, how the Sahaba radiallahu anhum called on that pact in order to. Uh, established justice and how all the Sahaba basically rallied around that same idea and that same pact. So we talked about that and that experience of the Prophet ﷺ around the age of 20. Similarly, in the early 20s now of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, much like what, what happens in any young, intelligent man's early 20s, the focus of the Prophet ﷺ started to shift to, um, you know, what we call settling down. And the first step of that is usually um, getting some type of work or trying to get a job or establishing some line, some form of income. And so that started to become the focus of the Prophet ﷺ as well. Now one thing I wanted to clarify here in the beginning of the session was, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, and this is well established throughout his life, the Prophet ﷺ, it wasn't just because of nubuwa or prophethood, he in and of himself just was not as a personality, and of course because he was the messenger of God, he wasn't very inclined towards materialism, he wasn't inclined towards wealth, he did, did, this just wasn't a part of his personal construct, wasn't a part of his personality. And then more so because of being the, the, being the messenger of Allah his life itself was a demonstration of the, of the ayah, was an implementation, implementation of the ayah, وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى That the akhirah is better and longer lasting, and that is established through the life and the example set forth by the Prophet ﷺ. But this is where we get to bring some balance to the rhetoric. We oftentimes have one of two extremes. This is something I've been talking about a lot lately, especially with the students. We, we unfortunately many times can be a community of extremes. And this is something the Prophet ﷺ warned us about. He warned us about ifrat and tafrit, bouncing between the two extremes. I often liken it to a pinball machine, how the ball just bounces from one end to the other. And that's because of a human reality that one extreme breeds the other. One extreme that we witness in the vast majority of society today is materialism and an obsession with material things, and how money is the basis of everything, and the value of human beings is established uh, based on value, that human beings are valued based on money, and that's how the human beings are valued, and that's how they're seen. That's one extreme. But a lot of times we can misinterpret religious um, you know, spiritual recommendations and a lot of the religious injunctions and the religious instructions, we can misinterpret them to, to say or to mean that money is absolutely evil and uh, money is unnecessary and everything is dunya and everything is bad and the only way to practice deen is to basically sit in the masjid, put a tasbih around your neck and do Allah Allah for the rest of your life. That that's religion, that's deen, that's Islam. But if you go out to work in the morning, if you try to feed your family, if you try to be a responsible, mature human being, dunya. You're obsessed with money, brother. You know, and I was even talking about in terms of marriage uh, with the students this past weekend. I taught the first um, happiness in the home seminar from Qalam. And that, that same topic came up in that seminar as well that a lot of times we view, you know, there's those two extremes again. We have one extreme where if a marriage proposal comes that we will solely base the validity of that marriage proposal based off of the amount of money that this person has. The amount of money that's involved here. 
And the other extreme, a lot of times, the religious, overly, overzealous religious rhetoric is that money has absolutely no value. So if somebody brings a marriage proposal and it's asked, well, what do you do for a living? Then oh, you're obviously obsessed with dunya. Brother, you have a problem. You have a disease in your heart and you need to go and fix that and correct that. When, whereas the reality is that Islam places gives us a balance in the middle. And a one very beautiful way we can observe that balance is through the life of the Prophet So the Messenger of Allah was raised by a man who didn't care for money? A man like Abu Talib, who was a Zahid. Alright? And similarly, the Messenger of Allah had very little to no desire or concern for wealth and money. And that's something that we know, something that we observe and we see in his life. Having said that, we see that the Messenger of Allah, one of the first initial steps he took to basically settle himself to start building a family, to kind of move into the adult phase of his life was, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ first concerned himself with a means of making a living. Because that was the responsible thing to do. That how am I going to support my family? That how am I going to support a spouse? How am I going to raise a family? How am I going to take care of my family? Now again, who feeds them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Nobody denies that. But there's a means to everything. There's a means to everything. In fact, the sulaha, the zuhada, the great scholars and pious people, the people who specialized in tazkiyah and spirituality, they often used to say that somebody who sits around saying that, oh, Allah will take care of it, Allah will take care of it, Allah will take care of it, that's not tawakkul. Rather, that is um, an indication and a sign of laziness, which is in itself is a heart disease of the heart. We know, i'qil thumma tawakkal. Right? That the Prophet of Allah said, tie your camel and then have tawakkul. And the Messenger of Allah in a hadith actually says that somebody who, the Prophet says some very strong words, he says, I condemn the person who's lazy, doesn't do anything, doesn't uh, go and try to utilize the means to fulfilling his need, and says, sits around and says, Allah will do it, Allah will do it, Allah will do it. The Prophet says, I condemn such a person and his actions, and I have nothing to do with that person. I mean, that person's not following the sunnah. And the Prophet says, I, I congratulate, and I support, and I, I, I promote the example of a person who works hard, does what is within his or her means, and then says, I've put my trust in Allah and the outcome is in the hands of Allah. If it happens, it happens. It was by the will and decree of Allah. And if it still doesn't happen after I've made an effort and put my best foot forward, then that was the will and the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see from the example of the Prophet ﷺ, when he's in his early 20s year, and obviously marriage is on his mind, and he's starting to thinking, he's, start, he's starting to consider marriage proposals and marriage opportunities. And we have some very, very weak uh, narrations from certain books of Sirah which talk about a couple of the initial proposals the Prophet ﷺ fielded. There's, there's one or two narrations which mention a proposal that was brought to Abu Talib for the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, it mentions that when Abu Talib asked the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ says, well, I need to go, I need to first start earning something, I need to start working, so that I'm, I'm capable of getting married financially. I'm responsible. And a couple of other weak narrations mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ expressed interest in one or two proposals, but that didn't end up working out because um, they decided to uh, pursue other proposals that were given for them based on tribal and family relations. One narration mentions that the Prophet ﷺ asked for a woman's hand in marriage, and the family basically said that oh, us and that family, we have relations established between us, and this was something that was an expectation that we would be arranging this marriage later on, and so therefore that didn't work out. So nevertheless, in his early 20s, the Prophet ﷺ decided to pursue business. Now, I've spoken about this before of why the Prophet ﷺ became a shepherd. First and foremost, because it was the will and the decree of Allah, and being a shepherd is something that all the Prophets had this experience of being shepherds. Because it would teach them, it would, it would um, cultivate the qualities of leadership and prophethood that would be necessary for their tasks and for their missions later on. So, but the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu only option in his teenage years was to be a shepherd was because the young men of Quraysh, especially from the family of Banu Hashim, a grandson of Abdul Muttalib, could only be a businessman. Any other menial task was considered below the dignity and the respect of the family. Pre-Islamically, these are all jahili uh, social constructs, so we understand that, that the family just would not allow the Prophet ﷺ to take any other job aside from shepherding, because again, that was seen as a means of doing the tarbiyah 
of building the character, the ta'di, building the character of the young men of the family. So now that the Prophet ﷺ reached his early 20s, there was only one choice, one, line, one career option, that was business. So the Prophet ﷺ was very interested in doing business. Now, here there was a little bit of a problem. You might recall we talked about in some of the earlier Sira sessions, and you can go back and listen to the recordings on the podcast if you weren't able to attend that session or listen to that session yet, that the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ had a very interesting experience around the age of 10 or 12 when he was traveling with his uncle Abu Talib on business towards Bilal al-Sham, and how they came across a rahib, they came across a Christian monk who observed and witnessed certain very interesting signs upon the Prophet ﷺ and immediately recognized and identified that there was something special about this young man. And he even warned his uncle and said that, I recommend you don't take him. Because just like I notice these things, there will be other who's, others who notice those things. And they might not have good intentions like I do. They might decide to take some action against this young man, maybe try to kill him, maybe try to kidnap him, maybe try to, you know, utilize him for their own means or their own benefits, their own agenda. So I recommend you be very careful with him and not take him over there. Based off of that experience, Abu Talib became very, um, he was very hesitant to take the Prophet ﷺ with him and to let him travel too far outside of Mecca after that point on. So the Prophet ﷺ initially requested his uncle Abu Talib, I want to go to Syria, I want to go to Bilal al-Sham to do business. His uncle immediately said, no, absolutely not, not happening. I told you before, you're not going there. That's it. I've said it. End of story. Now the Prophet of Allah ﷺ decided, okay, that's fine. Let me at least pursue some business opportunities locally. So it said that he, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, and, and there was one other concern that I mentioned previously. When the Prophet ﷺ first started doing shepherding, what motivated the Prophet ﷺ to do that, and aside from just becoming more productive with his time, <clears throat> was to help his uncle and the family's financial situation. Again, we see character here. That it's the responsibility of a young man to realize his responsibility towards his family and to start to pitch in and help out. This is part of character building. And I feel this is something of value that our elders, our previous generations, this is something that they were very keen about. A young man was put to work, even in this country. When you talk to older people of this country, they a lot of times are very shocked by the very enabled, entitled mentality that a lot of American youth have till today. That I don't, some people until their mid-twenties haven't worked a day in their lives. Why I'm going to school? Well, that's understandable, but how long are you going to go to school? All right, and then we have the predicament of people getting seven-year undergraduate degrees. Right, so it, it, it all factors in. This is part of ta'deeb. Adabani rabbi fa'ahsana ta'deebi. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, my, my Lord built my character. And He built me an excellent character. So a young man was expected, and this is part of the prophetic model and the prophetic uh, precedent, that a young man was expected to start helping out with the family. And it's a concern that a young man should start to become conscious and aware of. And that's how we can start to solve a lot of the problems of our youth as well, is that when we stop coddling them, that we treat them like the young adults that they are. Alright, and so the Messenger of Allah وسلم, wants to help out the family, wants to get up on his feet, wants to get established, and eventually work towards settling himself, which is marriage. So the Prophet of Allah وسلم, his uncle won't let him travel to Syria to do business. Alright, so he says, okay, a lot of times again what happens in our society, Oh, okay, I want to do that. No, you can't do that. Okay, then fine, forget it. Either I'm going to do that or nothing at all. Right? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi again through his life we learned a lesson. He says, no, let me make the best of what's available to me. Let me utilize whatever opportunity is at hand. So he said, let me start to pursue business locally. Now here's the interesting thing. To do business, to be a businessman, you need to have some merchandise. You need to have some money. Well, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi himself is an orphan. So he, didn't, he doesn't have any money, he didn't inherit anything. And his uncle, the man who's raising him, is a very generous, kind, noble man. But he also happens to be extremely poor himself. So now, what's he going to do? How's he going to get his business started? So the Prophet ﷺ, again, utilizing whatever was available to him, making the best of his situation, he decided to go into the business of brokering deals. Basically working on commission. Somebody has merchandise to sell, somebody has merchandise, um, some, or somebody is wholesaling merchandise, 
Somebody has bought merchandise and somebody is in the retail market looking to sell merchandise. So the Prophet ﷺ first started going around trying to bring these people together, trying to broker deals and hook up the wholesaler with the retailer and kind of the middleman business deal. All right, which is basically all, it's all hard work. Because a lot of times, you know, people don't value what you do in those situations. So again, we see the character of the Prophet ﷺ being developed. And so that's the type of business the Prophet ﷺ started with. He had a partner in his early days of doing business locally, he had a partner. So him and another young man decided to get together and do this business together. A man by the name of Asaib bin Abi Asaib, which is interesting because it means Saib, the son of the father of Saib. All right, so, but the man, his name, his kunya himself was Abu Saib. And what's interesting is his father was known by the same name. Later, his son, Abdullah ibn As Saib, was known also by the name of Abu Saib. So, this was kind of like a nickname that all the men of that family would get. So, this man who was known as Abu Saib, all right, he was the, the partner of the Prophet. He was his first business partner. He was his first business partner the co-worker of the Prophet ﷺ. And they started doing business locally, and alhamdulillah, they had some level of success, and they were able to cut, you know, actually do some good business deals, make some money for themselves, to get started, to be able to develop, and build up some type of a, some type of seed money, some launch money to go into business for themselves, and they were able to get started in this way. Something else very interesting about this business partner of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Sa Sa'ib, is that he was a very, very noble, respectable man. He was a very honest, trustworthy businessman. And the Prophet ﷺ himself was building a reputation of being a Sadiq al -Ameen. And this man similarly was a very honest, trustworthy man. Now here we see something interesting about the Prophet ﷺ after prophethood. Very interesting. In Fatih Makkah, in the conquest of Mecca, which is 20 years after Nubuwa, 20 years after prophethood, which basically means it's 40 years, almost 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ, 35, 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ did business with this man. Now he's a prophet, now he's a Nabi, now you know, much has moved on. So the son of that same man, Asaib, Abu Asaib, the business partner of the Prophet ﷺ, his son, his name was Abdullah, and he had become a Muslim. He had accepted Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Mecca, at the occasion of the conquest of Mecca, Fatih Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ met his old business partner. One narration actually says that he met his, own business, his old <laughs> business partner. And when the Prophet ﷺ met him, he greeted him, Affectionately, he embraced him, he met him, reminisced with him about the old days when they used to do business together. And then the Prophet ﷺ offered him a compliment. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ni'ma sharik Ni'ma sharik Abu Sa'ib. One narration, he says, Ni'ma al-Khalid Abu, Abu as Sa'ib. That he says that Abu, Abu Sa'ib is the best business partner. Abu Sa'ib is the best business partner, the best businessman that you can that you can get into business with. And the Prophet ﷺ praised him and complimented him on his honesty and his trustworthiness. And the Prophet ﷺ said, La yushari wa la yumari. La wa la yumari. Which basically means that he would never undercut somebody while doing business, and he would never lie and cheat while doing business. So the Prophet ﷺ remembered. This is again from the character of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam To remember people, and to remember the good of people, and to pay compliments to people. And Abu Asa'i, by the way, wasn't even Muslim when the Prophet was offering him this compliment. He just arrived in Mecca, he's meeting this man, it said he was minal mu'allafati qulubuhum. That the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam basically gave a gift to Abu Asa'ib and showed him kindness and generosity, and later Abu Asa'ib radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. But the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, even before he became Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ remembered him, praised him, complimented him, and reminisced with him, connected with him. Even though he, now he's Muhammadur Rasulullah ﷺ. He is Fatihu Makkah. He's the conqueror of Makkah. He's the most powerful man in Arabia. But he remembers somebody you did business with 40 years ago, and he says, Hey Abu Sahib, how's, how's it going? Long time no see. And then he looks to everybody around him, and he says, Abu Sahib, Best guy I ever did business with. Honest man, right here. There's, imagine that, there's no better recommendation than that. Right? If you're looking for a plug or looking for advertisement, 
right? You know, like today, like sports teams or, or um, business people, they try to get sports athletes to wear their apparel or celebrities to wear their hat. Imagine the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi giving you a shout out. <laughs> right? That's the best endorsement deal of all time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi endorsing your business. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi does that for somebody. That's the honesty, the generosity, the kindness of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And so, that's a little bit of the business history, Muhammad the businessman. That he first did business with this business partner, they were able to build up some seed money. And now the Prophet ﷺ had some more money, now he was ready to seriously do business. Now he goes back to his uncle, he goes back to Abu Talib and he's like, Come on uncle, please. Look, I've proven myself. I've established I can do business. I'll be okay, don't worry about me. One narration, not all the books of Sirah basically concur with this. One narration says that the very first trip the Prophet ﷺ took for business outside of you know, Mecca and Hijaz all the way to Bilad al-Sham was on behalf of his uncle Abu Talib. One narration does say he first went on his first business trip and he really, really established himself a reputation, not just for his honesty and his trustworthiness, but also for his intelligence. People were like, man, he's a very, very good businessman. And so one book of Sirah actually mentions this. Now that this reputation for the Prophet ﷺ was established, there was a very wealthy woman in Mecca by the name of Khadija bint Khuwaylid. And of course we'll say radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers Khadija radiallahu anha. But at this point in time, this was a wealthy widow who lived in Mecca by the name of Khadija bint Khuwaylid. And she had been married twice before actually. Um, her second husband had also passed away and she was a widow at this point. She was extremely wealthy, not just wealthy because she maybe, you know, because of her husband's wealth, but she was born into a wealthier family herself. Her, her father, Khuwaylid, was a very extremely wealthy man himself. So she was born into wealth and she was a very wealthy woman who possessed a lot of business assets and basically what she decided to do with her wealth in order to invest it and grow it was she decided to um, you know, invested into business, into doing further business. And the way that she decided to do that further business was she decided to, um, you know, hire businessmen to go take her wealth, take her money, and go and do business on her behalf um, in Bilad al-Sham. To take goods from Mecca, go and sell them over there, buy more goods from over there, and bring them back to Mecca to sell. The problem was that, of course, because of the culture and the situation and the overall lack of safety at that time, a woman wouldn't be able to do that part of her business herself. She would not be able to sell the goods herself and travel for the sake of business herself. So she would have to hire someone to do business on her behalf. Now, that was a major problem for her. Because who would she hire? Who could she hire? Who could she trust? Who could she not trust? And so that was a major cause of concern for her and a major problem for her. When she started to hear around Mecca, the reputation of this young man named Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was very intelligent, a good businessman, but above all he was honest and trustworthy, she became extremely interested. And she called uh, for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come and meet her in regards to a business proposal. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went and met with her and she basically told him that I'd like you to do business on my behalf. Now, the narrations don't make it very clear, but there's something very interesting in the narration that it says that she offered the Prophet ﷺ twice, as, twice the amount of commission that she would offer anybody else, that she had offer, offered anyone else. Now, why would she offer twice the amount of money, aside from maybe trying to you know, secure the services of this person because he was so sought after or because he was so trustworthy, some of the scholars have read in between the lines and they say that maybe initially the Prophet ﷺ declined. Because he had been working, he had been trying to establish a business for himself, that maybe it's very, very possible that the Prophet ﷺ initially um, you know, declined her request and said, you know what, thank you very much, I'm very flattered, I appreciate the offer, but really not interested. So she offered the Prophet ﷺ twice the commission. No, no, I'll offer you twice the amount of money, but I want you to do business for me. I want you to work for me. 
Based off of that, the Prophet ﷺ agreed and decided to work for her. One, some of the narrations that don't mention the fact that the Prophet ﷺ first initially traveled on behalf of his uncle Abu Talib to do business to Asham, to Syria, say that the Prophet ﷺ said, however, there's a problem. My uncle does not want me to travel for business. So it also mentions that she in fact went and spoke to Abu Talib herself saying, I want you to, your nephew to do business for me and inshallah, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very hopeful everything will be okay, I hope that everything will be fine and that everything should be alright and in fact if it makes you feel any better, I have a slave by the name of Maysara that I will send with the Prophet I mean it's actually mentioned that Maysara was somebody who was very physically talented and gifted and he was actually very, a very skilled fighter and archer. And that, that was basically the bodyguard of Khadija. So Maysara was the bodyguard of Khadija radiallahu anha. And she said, I'll send Maysara with him. He'll be okay, he'll be safe. Allow your nephew to do business for me. This will be good for everybody involved, I promise to you. And some of the narrations at that point say the reason why Khadija offered twice the amount of money was Abu Talib said, you know, I'm very hesitant, but you got to make it worth our while. I want you to pay him double what you normally would pay somebody. Right, so Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, looking out for the best interests of the Prophet ﷺ, he demanded twice the amount of money, which shows that there's nothing wrong with a little negotiation. And if somebody really is that talented, then you should compensate them accordingly. Alright, so nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ now goes to do business on behalf of Khadija anha, with her slave Maysara. Now when they set out on this journey and they're traveling to Bilad al-Sham, the, the region of Syria and now even more the broader region um, than even what is modern day Syria today, along the way some interesting things start to happen. Now they, they stopped, remember I told you where Buhaira had interacted with the Prophet ﷺ, the monk? Now the reason why they stopped there the first time around as well was that's where Quraysh always stopped when traveling for business. It was kind of like a, like a truck stop, like a rest area. They would always stop there. There were some supplies, there was a well, there were some vendors. There was, it was a nice place to stop. You could basically relieve yourself during your stop there. So it was a rest area. And so the Prophet ﷺ and Maysara, as was habit for all of Quraysh, they stopped there while, you know, on their journey. Now the narrations mentioned that it was not Buhaira at this time. It was another monk who was resident at the monastery there by now. But it still mentions in the narration that when they stopped there and the Prophet ﷺ was resting underneath a tree, under the shade of a tree, that Maysara, the slave, was maybe getting some supplies or doing some work. or So the monk, as he would often do, because the monastery was positioned kind of at a high place and he could see who came and who didn't. So he spotted that some travelers have arrived and he spotted something very interesting. So he kind of came down from the monastery and he meets the slave Maysara at the water well and he says that, who's that man sitting under that tree? So Maysara said, Huwa Muhammad ibn Abdullah. That's Muhammad the son of Abdullah. Min ahl al-Quraysh, min ahl al-Haram that he's from the people of Quraysh, they are the caretakers of the Haram, giving an introduction to the Prophet ﷺ. The monk at that time tells Maysara that لا يجلس تحت هذه الشجرة إلا نبيون. No man will sit underneath that tree at this time, at this place. Nobody will sit under that tree except for a Prophet. And so he basically he tells Maysara that there's something special about that man. And that this is a sign that I've read in our texts and our scriptures. And so he spots the Prophet and he tells Maysara this. Now that piques the interest of Maysara. They go to Sham, they sell all the business goods, and in fact they make more profit than was normally made. Now they're coming back from Sham with goods that they purchased based on the money that they made in Sham. They purchase more goods that are specific to the region of Sham to come back and sell in Mecca. When they arrive back in Mecca with all these goods, now they're selling these goods in Mecca. That's part of the whole business arrangement. And again, the goods that they sell in Mecca make more profit than normal. So make, made a, a very solid profit over there, extraordinary profit over there. And now they come back to Mecca and make an extraordinary profit in Mecca. So all of this good stuff is happening. And I, in fact, I forgot to mention, on the way back traveling from Bilad al-Sham, you know, Maysara spots something else. So remember Maysara when he talks to a monk, it piques his interest. 
So now while traveling back from Asham, Maysar has been kind of keeping an eye on the Prophet ﷺ. He travels a little bit behind him, he stays a few steps behind him, kind of keeps an eye on him. So Maysar in fact says that on the way back, it was some of the most extreme heat that we had dealt with on that journey. And during that extreme heat, it was so brutal. And I noticed that the Prophet ﷺ generally seemed very calm. Calmer than a person should be traveling in such brutal heat. So it kind of piqued my interest, what's going on here? So he says, I look up and I see that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad to him, this man, Muhammad, he's being covered by a shade as he's traveling. He's being covered by a shade by, while he's traveling. And in fact, the narration on behalf of Maysara says, that is, it's as if I saw two angels shading, providing shade over Muhammad as he was traveling. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now Maysara is completely blown away. They get back to Mecca, like I said, they make the Prophet. Now when they finally sit down with Khadija to settle the account, and the Prophet ﷺ offers the records to Khadija radiallahu anha, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. He's giving her a full breakdown. Um, and so some of the details are mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ was very, very precise. He was very particular, very precise. And he would, re he would refer back to Maysara to corroborate every single little thing about the business transactions. Maysara, was it like this? Wasn't it like that? Wasn't it like this? Wasn't it like that? And he concurs everything with Maysara. And so Khadija, first of all, is very impressed by the honesty, by the, by the, um, by the, detail, the care for detail and atten the, the, the attention to detail that the Prophet displays. And then after everything is done and, and the accounts are settled, and Khadija gives the commission to the Prophet ﷺ as was promised and agreed to beforehand, and the Prophet ﷺ goes about his way, she then sits with Maysara and she says, what can you tell me about him? What did you see? What did you observe? Is he good? Should we continue to do business with him? And Maysara says, oh, he's beyond honest. You have no, nothing to worry about in that regard. You saw. He's beyond honest. In fact, on top of that, he says, not, should this man should not just be hired based on his honesty, but he's very intelligent. He's a good businessman. I saw him in action. He knows what he's doing when he does business. And he's honest. And then aside from everything else, Maysara says, take it or leave it. But there's something extraordinary about this man. There's something very unique about this man. And he goes on to tell Khadija radiallahu anha about some of the things that he witnessed and the conversation with the monk and some of the things that he saw. And so... He very much piques the interest of Khadija radiallahu anha. The narrations go on to mention that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, engaged in a few, in a couple of more business deals with Khadija radiallahu. By now, Abu Talib felt a little bit better as well. You know that he came back safe and sound, and he was okay. So the narrations go on to mention that he did a couple of more business deals with Khadija radiallahu anha, with very very similar results. Very good prophets, nothing but extraordinary, exemplary character, honesty, trustworthiness. And by now, Khadija radiallahu anha is becoming more and more impressed and even interested in this young man. So, at this point in time, the Prophet of Allah, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha, um, inquires basically speaks to one of her friends. It first mentions that she went and spoke to one of her cousins, a man by the name of Waraqa bin Nawfal. And she speaks to Waraqa and she says, there's a man named Muhammad, have you heard of him? And Waraqa says, yeah, I've heard something about him. He sounds like a good young man, he comes from a good family. I've seen him, I've interacted a little bit with him, just generally outside, like, hi, hello, how's it going? And he seems like a very good, well-behaved, honest young man. And of course, I hear the reputation, as Sadiq al amin right? And then Khadija radiallahu anha tells her cousin Waraqa about some of the experience she, she's had in doing business with him. And Waraqa says he sounds exemplary. Now Khadija radiallahu anha, because she was such a wealthy woman, and it said she was a woman of great beauty, she was extremely intelligent, she was also very wealthy, she was, and she was single, she was a widow. So she'd been fielding many, many marriage proposals for a long time now. But she was, she was very... Um, concerned and she was in fact very even skeptical of a lot of the marriage proposals that were coming her way because she was so wealthy she was always worried about maybe somebody trying to marry her quote unquote for her money and she was very concerned about that and she wanted to ma make sure that she married somebody of exemplary character and she similarly wanted to marry somebody for you know her character she, wa she wanted somebody who wanted to marry her for her character not her money so now she's interested in the Prophet of Allah 
So she asks her cousin Waraka. Waraka says, recommends it, says, I think it's a very good marriage proposal and I think you should pursue it. She speaks to one of her good friends. Um, the name uh, can be pronounced in two ways. Both are Arabic names. One is Nafisa, one is Nufaysa. Uh, which have different meanings but from the same root and the same core. So she speaks to one of her friends, Nafisa or Nufaysa, and um, she asks her, do you know about Muhammad? She goes, yeah, I, I do know about him. What do you think about him? She says, I've only heard good things. Well, these are my experiences with him. What should we do? And she says, I think you should pursue the marriage proposal. She goes, but how am I supposed to exactly go about it? Because how do I approach this matter? So her friend Nafisa says, are you interested? She says, yes, absolutely. She goes, all right, then let me take care of it. I'll take care of it, I'll speak on your behalf, I'll help you out with this, all right? Now, Nafisa goes to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He goes, you obviously know Khadija, you do business for her and with her. He says, yes. He goes, what do you think about her as a person, as a woman? He goes, she has exemplary character, very honest, very trustworthy, very straightforward. I've only seen good from her. So he goes, would you consider her for marriage? So the Prophet of Allah says, is she interested in marriage? He says, yes, I wouldn't be here talking to you if she wasn't. So the Prophet of Allah says, yes, if, I mean, if, if she, as long as she's interested, I would also be interested in marriage. And so then the narration basically goes on to say that now Nafisa and the Prophet of Allah go to his uncle Abu Talib to speak to him about this marriage proposal. And um, inshallah we'll go ahead and stop here. A little bit of a cliffhanger. Not really because everybody knows what happened. <laughs> All right. So uh, trying to bring the people back next week. No, but mashallah everybody knows exactly what happens. But from here it's a very interesting narration and process. And it talks a lot uh, in detail about the exact discussions and the dialogues. And the different uh, discussions that happen from here on out. And um, so we'll continue on from here next week. But nevertheless some of the lessons I just want to recap that we learned today. We learn about the process of doing business. Obviously, business is permissible. Not just that, but the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu was an honest businessman. And he was a trustworthy businessman. And there's a very famous athar that goes, Atajirus as al-Amin. That a trustworthy, honest businessman, ma'an nabiyin wa siddiqin wa shuhada wa salihin, will be with the prophets and the martyrs and the honest and the trustworthy, the pious, righteous people. That an honest, trustworthy businessman will be in the ranks of the prophets and the martyrs and the pious and the righteous. So the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set this precedent in, the, in this example for us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an example on how to establish personal relationships. That when he meets a man that he did business with 40 years ago, he praises the man. And he appreciates the man's honesty. And he remembers the man. And shows him very special attention. Even though now, he's the conqueror of Mecca. But yet, he takes out time to speak to this man. And appreciates the man's honesty. And um, embraces the man. And then of course, we see the honesty and the trustworthiness in the business dealings of the Prophet ﷺ. Similarly, we learn a lesson about marriage. And how the number one qualification for marriage is character. Khadija radiallahu anha considered the Prophet based off of his character, his honesty and his trustworthiness. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu considered Khadija radiallahu anha based off of her character, her honesty and her trustworthiness. What lesson do we learn from that? We learn from that that yes, deen is very important. But one of the most important manifestations of deen is in character. Again, we have two extremes. Today, people consider marriage proposals simply based on social or material qualifiers. What family do they come from? How beautiful or handsome are they? How much money do they got? How, what type of an education do they have? Worldly education. But we also have an opposite extreme where people solely will consider a marriage proposal or a spouse based on religious superficial qualifiers. Does he have a beard? Does he wear a kufi? Does he wear a thobe? Does she wear hijab? How much Qur'an has she memorized? You know, what activities or, or, or you know, what type of a hijab does she wear? You know, religious, superficial religious qualifiers. We have to understand that character is the most important thing. And character is a part and parcel of our deen and it's a manifestation of a person's deen. When people, you know, when people ask me for recommendations and this is something I learned from my teachers and they learned from their teachers. And we see this from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That when people ask for, you know, advice on a marriage proposal, even if the person outwardly or or superficially might seem very religious, quote unquote religious and pious, the character is very important. And the character should never be ignored. 
The character should never be ignored. Because that is a manifestation and shows the sincerity in a person's religion and their deen. And it's very, very important. Some very, very superficially on the outside religious people get married only to realize that they turn out to be people of very bad character, which means they have not internalized their deen. They're not really religious because they never internalize their religion and they end up suffering because of it. When the Prophet of Allah said much later in Nubuwa, when a marriage proposal is brought to him of a Muslim, a Sahabi radiallahu anhu, the Prophet says, don't marry that man. He tells the Sahabi, don't marry that man. Why? Because he says he has a very bad temper. He has a very bad temper. In fact, I know this as a counselor, as a leader of the community, I know that he's not able to control his temper a lot of times. That he physically cannot control his temper a lot of times. I recommend you not marry that man. The Messenger of Allah said this. So we see this from the example of the Prophet that nothing is more important to consider than character because character is the greatest sign of a person's deen and of a person's iman, akhlaq is a part of our deen, is a part of our religion, and is a part of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasakhfirku wa natubu ilayk.